percutaneous tracheostomy using the traco dilator set. First, position the patient uh, with, the with the trachea well forward. Prior to doing this positioning, the endotracheal tube needs to be removed from the lower from the trachea. Options for that are to draw the existing tube to a situation just above the cords, inflate the balloon and hold it there. A second option is to infiltrate is to intubate the patient with a smaller tube like a size 6 that is sighted just to the cords and then typically will not occupy the trachea. The final option is a supraglottic airway, but because of the extreme neck extension required, supraglottic airway does not always seat well. Once positioned, uh, once looking for the landmark, which is ideally meant to be the space below the second tracheal ring. So we count from the cryoid, first ring, second ring, the space between the second and third tracheal ring. If you have a patient who is hyperinflated, the space is limited, one may have to settle for halfway between the manubrium and the cricoid, but ideally we should be aiming at the second tracheal interspace. Not shown on this diagram, but prior to making a skin incision, we, it is my practice to infiltrate about 20 milliliters of local anesthetic containing a 1 in 200,000 adrenaline infusion or adrenaline mixture. The purpose of that adrenaline is to vasoconstrict the small non-anatomically uh, securable blood vessels. It's also a good point at this point to look for obvious blood vessels that may be a site of bleeding and if they're in the way possibly the procedure might have to be not commenced. Once the local anesthetic has been given and the patient has been properly draped with a one meter radius in all directions, we start the procedure. We start with a skin incision over the projected site of the tracheal puncture. It needs to be about one and a half times the diameter of the tracheal tube in length. It can be done vertically or horizontally. I normally do it horizontally. That incision should be just through the skin and, and just so that you through the skin into the subcutaneous tissue. It should not be any deeper. If you do happen at this point to observe a blood vessel in the way, you would stop the procedure at this point or make a plan to secure that blood vessel. If you've made the skin incision successfully, you will then go to the actual access and the key step Step six is the most important step of the entire procedure. We need to place the uh, IV cannula into the trachea. That needs to be in the midline at the appropriate interspace. It is absolutely vital to have this in the midline at the appropriate interspace without also simultaneously damaging the posterior wall of the trachea. So we make the initial approach using a, a saline filled syringe, a 14 gauge IV cannula, go vertically downwards, perpendicular to the floor until you have got a free flow of air on aspiration. Mentally make sure that not just the needle tip, but the actual IV cannula is within the trachea. This is where, if it is available, it is mandatory to have a bronchoscope to check that you have not gone too deep and damaged the posterior tracheal wall and that your IV cannula is indeed within the trachea. Once you're sure that the IV cannula is itself in the trachea, let the tail of the syringe uh, needle complex go towards the patient's head so that you're at about a 30 to 45 degree angle and then slide the IV cannula off the metals uh, needle that you hold constant. At this stage it is vital to ensure that the cannula slides in with no resistance. It should almost fall in. If that doesn't happen, you're in the wrong place or you're too deep, stop and restart with a new IV cannula.
If you have successfully slid the IV cannula in, attach a syringe, make sure there's still free flow of air. This now represents the IV cannula properly sighted. I normally let the IV cannula go in until it's at the hub to ensure that it is actually in the trachea and that I'm, that's my clinical confirmation that I'm in the trachea. After this step, the rest of the procedure follows a mechanical sequence. The next step is to insert the guide wire through the cannula. It's my practice to gently and slowly insert the guide wire until it just lodges in the bronchus and I can't insert it anymore. If you are concerned about pulmonary hemorrhage, don't insert it that deep, but normally gently gives you the security that you are again confirming an intratracheal placement. Then over the guide wire, put in the first stage dilator that you introduce at about a 30 degree angle. Ensure that you have the shoulder of the first stage dilator within the trachea. Again, if you have a bronchoscope available, you can confirm this clinically. In the meantime, it is always a good clinical practice to check that the guide wire is still freely movable. That implies that it is not kinked. Once the first stage dilator has been placed, put the white guide wire protector over the guide wire until you reach the little elevated ridge and that is at the skin. You have previous to placing the guide wire removed the first stage dilator. Now comes the mechanical dilatation. Over the guide wire and guide wire protector insert the green so-called rhino horn dilator. Prior to inserting it put the rhino horn dilator in sterile water, a bowl of sterile water for about 30 seconds to activate the lubricious coating. Now we need to insert the guide wire in a controlled format and it is basically a forceful but continuous dilation. Um, it, I usually find it convenient to stand as a right-hander to stand on the patient's left and with a forehand maneuver gently insert the, uh, the dilator progressively um, so that ensuring it runs always at approximately the same angle to the skin until you've inserted it at the 41 centimeter mark the two lines is at the skin that is for a size 8 tracheostomy once you've inserted the green dilator leave it there for about 30 seconds so the tissues can stretch then withdraw the green dilator Maintain the guide wire and guide wire protector in situ. Thread the tracheostomy tube and its introducer over the guide wire and guide wire protector and repeat the exactly the same maneuver that you used for the, the green dilator with the tracheostomy tube and its introducer. Once you pushed it in, hold the tracheostomy tube in situ by its flanges on the side, pull out together the green tracheostomy introducer, the guide wire protector and the guide wire. I find it useful to prior to doing that to inflate the cuff to give myself a little bit of security. Having removed those, inflate the cuff if you haven't already done that, put the inner tube into the tracheostomy and lock it attach a sterile catheter mount to your ventilator, confirm ventilation by a chest rise on the ventilation and the return of CO2 on the capnograph. Finally, to obtain hemostasis, it's my practice to, uh, coming back to here, it's my practice to suture the, ET, the, the tracheostomy tube in situ with four nylon sutures that are meant to hold this device immobile for 24 hours to secure hemostasis and after 24 hours they can be removed and conventional tracheostomy tapes can be applied. And at the end of the procedure then you should have a sighted tracheostomy tube with inner tube. Um, any small blood vessels should be constricted by the physical presence of the device and conventional tracheostomy management now follows.